So the number one thing that I think gRPC has uh, that might be different from other things is real world usage. Um, you might be thinking REST, JSON, all this stuff has plenty of real world usage. But um, the thing that I kind of want to stress is that um, there are really good projects out there that are both modern and mature using gRPC um, that, that are open source that you can go read their code. So examples of two that I would um, point people to are Vitesse and uh, my own SpiceDB. Um, the, like, these projects kind of are different because uh, gRPC kind of crosses different language ecosystems. So you can kind of see best practices and things and extrapolate those workflows regardless of what your, your domain or your project is. Um, unlike kind of REST APIs where, sure, if you're building a web app uh, and you're doing it in Ruby, it makes sense for you to look at maybe what folks are using in the Rails ecosystem. But if you're writing stuff in, um, if you're trying to write, I don't know, a database software, it may not be useful to see how REST APIs are implemented in, in web apps, for example. Um, so that's that's just my straw man argument against um, kind of like the real world usage in other systems. Um, but the super cool thing about gRPC is that you get to kind of see these idioms and patterns that are used in these mature projects. Um, you can straight up copy them. Um, but not only that, because we have open source and the, the core of the ecosystem for gRPC, uh, you can actually kind of go into the pull requests and commit messages for the software and read the justifications behind the decisions that they've made. Why are they doing particular things? Why have they chosen this? Um, you, maybe you'll see that like actually this is a workaround for some other behavior or they're, they're actually addressing legacy clients, for example. So that can be um, nice warnings for you to be like, oh, uh, if, you, if you don't have that legacy, maybe you don't need to do this particular thing, right? Um, but you get to kind of see these mature projects and see what their workflows are, what tools do they use. Um, for example, uh, deprecating RPCs or um, doing API versioning. These aren't things that you'll find in the gRPC documentation. There's no one way to do these things. But if you look at all these different projects that are mature and kind of following the best practices, you can arrive at what you think that solution should look like for your use case um, in a well-informed way that you might otherwise not be able to do. All right, so um, now that we've kind of gotten that one out of the way, that was big number one. Uh, big number two is Buff. Um, so Buff is a fast, extremely fast protobuf compiler. Um, so it's an alternative to proto-C, which if you're following any of the tutorials or official documentation for gRPC, that's the compiler you're using. Um, now the value for buff isn't so much in the speed of the compiler, um, but actually the workflow that it provides. So buff was originally written at, um, well, it, buff is the spiritual successor of a tool that was internally developed at Uber to manage all of their APIs. Um, and the big value that I think that Buff gives you is an improvement over um, kind of writing bash scripts to, to do workflows in, in, um, in gRPC and dealing with these protobuf definitions. Um, but most powerfully, it has static analysis um, and linting for your definitions. Um, and I think this is so important that I even wrote a blog post about it that is featured on Buff's website. Um, and if you look at kind of like the last line of text there, that subtitle, I call it the first day of the rest of your life. Because the second you create an API, um, you're stuck with it now. Um, once people start calling it, you're going to have to maintain it. Um, creating the code is just the first step. Um, code typically outlives you if you're working on a project that uh, is, is going to be serving customers. Um, and so uh, you might not always have proto experts available to you to help you with design decisions. So, uh, and, and honestly, it's hard to keep up with all the changes necessarily. But the nice thing about Buff is that um, once someone learns what those best practices are, if they can codify it, um, they will build it in as a lint rule to Buff. And then everyone who's using Buff will get um, basically uh, if it's built into your CI or just your local tooling, you'll be aware the second you write the code that um, that you're either breaking, you're violating something, um, or you're not doing the best practice. 
the really, really, really cool thing and most useful thing with Buff is actually detects breaking API changes. So it can tell you if what you've changed versus what you had changes the protobuf wire format representation enough that you're going to break clients. Um, that's incredibly powerful if you're trying to figure out um, how to move forward um, or do backwards compatibility um, with new iterations of the same API. Um, and uh, kind of like the, the big value here, and the reason why I think buff is number two, is because if you're, um, if you're maintaining REST APIs, for example, uh, let's use the guiding, guiding, uh, the guiding light, the North Star of the industry, which is Stripe. Um, Stripe has basically uh, clients that haven't been touched that are still calling the same APIs perfectly compatibly 15 years later. Um, but to do that, they have to hire a whole team to manage their API and they have to write a bunch of custom tools and typically doing integration tests against their APIs. So they're actually testing the API after the, all the code is there um, and uh, kind of like the complete end-to-end -end experience versus a lot of the same logic that they're testing um, when you're using something like gRPC, any kind of like RPC language that has this IDL form that we can do static analysis on, we can catch a good amount of these problems the second you write the, write the actual definition of the API. We don't have to write a client, we don't have to generate a client or anything like that, we don't have to like test it end to end in a real system to, to tell whether there's a problem. Um, and you don't need to hire all the engineers to build all of that stuff for you and make sure you're maintaining all of that if you just have a static analysis tool that runs in your editor or runs in your CI that does this for you. Um, this is a huge boon of production. Uh, um, if you are not using Buff but you're using gRPC, highly recommend you look into it. Um, so talking about tooling, um, the next one is a library. So Google APIs is um, basically a collection of shared types um, from Google's protobuf uh, APIs. Basically, um, they had a whole bunch of services that were using protobuf externally facing to the internet, and um, they decided to refactor basically and pull out all the common types across those APIs. Um, turns out, common types across Google APIs are also useful. They're probably going to be common types across your APIs as well. So uh, you'll see general patterns here for error handling, managing times and durations, key value pairs, defend data structures like this. Um, and the super nice thing about this is actually, uh, depending on what language you're writing in, there might also already be a library that exists for these types. So instead of you having to define your own new type, for um, timestamps, for example, Google already has one for timestamps, and their timestamp library is going to convert between that format and the standard library's um, time type uh, that uh, that is built in your language, native in your language. So you get a lot of really easy conversions. Um, between your native language types. So you can use all the libraries you've written, keep their, all, all your code um, kind of like native to the language and not coupled to protobuf um, if, you, if you adopt uh, some of the Google APIs. So um, the other warning thing here is that I will say it's kind of tricky to know if a project has overlooked Google APIs or deemed it um, too much complexity and not worth adopting. So the reason why uh, traditionally a lot of folks won't have adopted Google APIs is because prior to Buff, there weren't really good workflows for importing libraries into um, your own protobuf uh, kind of definitions and generations. So uh, now that Buff exists, it's really easy to add a dependency to something. But prior to that, uh, you would have typically vendored it at a particular version. Um, which means copying and pasting the code and maintaining it yourself uh, from that point on. Um, so that's kind of error prone and clunky and not a lot of people like understand how, uh, how to do the magical incantation for the Proto-C compiler flags. Um, so uh, a lot of people have actually avoided using third party uh, dependencies when it comes to protobuf and gRPC, but that should no longer be the case. So if you see useful types in here, I say go for it. Um, Next, uh, in the same vein of trying to avoid writing as much code as possible, um, don't write if someone else has. There's uh, this custom plugin, which I'll get into custom plugins later, spoilers. Um, 
but product gen validate, which uh, basically writes a validation method so that you don't have to. In your protobuf definitions, you can annotate fields and say, um, for example, you have a byte field um, and in a message and you can actually annotate it and say, this field should never be more than 128 kilobytes. Um, or the string field should only contain this uh, strings that fit this regular expression. Um, and once you've annotated that, uh, you generate code that gives you this validation method. And uh, if you call this validate, it throws an error if all of those um, constraints that you associate with those types in the protobuf definition um, are not met. Um, and this supports a variety of languages. It supports Go, C++, Java, Python. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if this exists in all those languages, but in Go, there's a really nice middleware that you can use that actually uh, you slot into a server and it basically uh, returns early with an error if any of the requests coming in uh, are not valid, like the validation method throws an error. So that means you don't actually have to manually even call the validate method in your handlers to know um, that uh, every single request coming in meets the constraints that you've labeled uh, you've annotated in your protobuf definitions. Incredibly powerful stuff, and you basically don't get, you don't have to write the code. You have way less um, room for human error and making any mistakes in what can be pretty sensitive stuff. You don't want to accept uh, like corner cases or, or very, uh, very corrupted uh, forms of RPC requests, right? Um, so there's another project up here called gRPC Gateway, originally written by Johann Braunhorst. And uh, what it does is it uh, works very similar to product gen validate, where you annotate your protos, but this time you annotate it with an HTTP path and an HTTP method. Um, and it generates for you a reverse proxy that will sit in front of your gRPC application and actually convert JSON HTTP requests into um, gRPC requests and then talk to your service and then your service will write a response back to the reverse proxy and then it will take that response and convert it into JSON HTTP and return that to um, the client. So that means your client, you could support legacy clients, you can support um, environments that cannot use gRPC, maybe they have um, they have like some kind of memory uh, restrictions because uh, they're an embedded system or anything like that. You can support all these environments um, and not write code to do it, you can just generate that code. Um, What's super cool about this is not only can you generate the code to do that, you can also generate documentation for the HTTP API it generates, um, but also you can use that um, that uh, same exact generation tool to generate clients. Um, so this is all using OpenAPI. If you're uh, unfamiliar, you can Google that or uh, Google Swagger, which is the thing that inspired OpenAPI. Um, but at the end of the day, what it lets you do is have API documentation and even generate clients for HTTP. So what that means is you can write a gRPC service definition and have it generate both documentation for gRPC, the gRPC service itself, um, documentation for HTTP, and the HTTP service itself, right? Uh, services and clients, right? For, for both. Um, incredibly, incredibly powerful stuff, uh, supporting multiple protocols. It's, it may even be a better way of just writing and maintaining REST APIs at the end of the day, even if you choose to never use the gRPC APIs, or maybe your customers don't, uh, or users don't necessarily use it as much. Um, so uh, there's a really, really cool thing for Go programmers here, which is because gRPC Gateway is actually written in Go, um, you can do this additional trick where you can actually, instead of running the reverse proxy as a separate, proce uh, as a separate process, um, you can actually run it in the same process um, so that it just calls directly into your app, like in memory. Um, but uh, even cooler is you, you can actually make them share the same port if you're willing to sacrifice some performance. Um, by using a trick where you read the first couple bytes of a connection and determine whether the request is gRPC or HTTP and then route up accordingly uh, internally to your application. Um, so that's really, really cool stuff. You can basically expose one single port for your Go, Go service and it can serve HTTP and gRPC. Um, all right, um, I mentioned middleware a little bit um, and I think that like uh, one of the super, super useful and most interesting things about gRPC is that you can actually support client middleware. Um, 
So there, there is, uh, when, when people think of middleware, they almost always think of server-side middleware. Um, they think of adding on new behavior or like authentication or authorization into um, kind of like their handlers and changing the handlers in, um, in a server. But um, what's super interesting about gRPC is it actually has middleware on both sides. Um, and that is less common, but extremely powerful. Um, so powerful that I argue it kind of alleviates the need for an API gateway a lot of the time. Um, like, let's forget about all the rest stuff I was just talking about. Like, let's get back into why why we like why are, we're using gRPC. Like, let's take full advantage of it. Um, with a single line of code, we can add authentication, compression. Um, modern observability, including logging metrics and tracing. We can do timeouts, rate limiting, uh, recoveries, exponential back off. Um, and like all this stuff is a single line import into your client, your client. Um, and you might be wondering, well, like, why? Why would I want that in my client? Um, uh, Google actually believes um, internally in kind of this philosophy that is dumb servers, smart clients. Um, and the value that that has is it lets you actually like iterate on your design a lot on the client side. Um, you're going to do more work and it may be a little bit more complicated, but it avoids you um, putting behavior into the server that you're going to then have as tech debt forever. You'll have to be uh, maintaining that forever forwards. Um, so if you're not 100% confident that, that that is behavior that you need server side, first you should try to experiment with a client side um, and make a really, really smart client. A great example of this is actually kubectl for a super long time in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, the Kubernetes API service was pretty basic um, and kubectl, when you did kubectl apply, it did all of this logic to figure out what needed to be applied um, to the, the um, actual uh, etcd um, inside of kubernetes um, but nowadays we have uh, finally uh, a lot of that logic that was being done in apply uh, we came to the conclusion that this was core logic it should actually be in the server and now we have server side apply in kubernetes right um, so this is an example of that make the client really smart until you know that this is core behavior and then you can move that into the server um, smart clients uh, highly recommended if you're developing a service and you don't know exactly what should be in the server yet um, so custom plugins I've mentioned a couple plugins so far uh, I mentioned how we can generate all these different things additionally um, so what a plugin does is it is the hook that generates code in a protobuf compiler um, so uh, for example when you generate uh, your protobufs in, in a particular language so you use go for example um, that is a the go plugin and then there's a go grpc plugin which generates your service definitions in go um, when, when i was talking about product gen validate that generates your validation methods um, that is an additional plugin um, uh, when I talked about uh, kind of the open API and uh, the different HTTP um, content that you can generate, these are additional plugins that you can generate off of your protobuf definitions. But um, what's really cool is that uh, we can write our own plugins. Um, we're not beholden to just whatever plugins exist for already for gRPC and protobuf. Um, so if you see your problem, like th these other projects that I just mentioned, uh, you can fix that problem. And what's really interesting is you can even address problems that you find in the foundational plugins, for example, the Go plugin or the, um, or the gRPC plugin. For example, the folks over at PlanetScale, while developing Vitesse, um, built this project called VT Protobuf. Um, what they noticed was that when you are writing um, Go code uh, for gRPC or for just Protobuf generally, um, what you're doing is you're actually um, using runtime type reflection in Go when you're encoding and decoding um, to two bytes um, to the protobuf wire format. And so uh, that's really slow. Um, and they're trying to write a high performance server. So they realized like, hey, we actually have all this information ahead of time. We know because we have the definitions and we're generating the code to do all this stuff. We know what the size of this thing um, when it's encoded is going to be statically. Um, and we know all these types statically already. Why aren't we using that information when we encode and decode? Um, so what they did is they wrote their own custom plugin 
that uh, generates the code that does all that. So when you use encode and decode, um, like their marshal, vt marshal and vtun marshal, um, you're actually not doing any reflection and it's way more performant than the built-in encoding and decoding um, that you get with uh, gRPC. So even when you hit the core, um, <laughs> core uh, like you, you hit the boundaries of what you can actually do with the core technology, it also gives you a door to kind of like sidestep it and do whatever you need um, just, to, just to solve your problem. So custom plugins are incredibly powerful um, because uh, there wasn't really a lot of documentation or um, really a specification even around um, the input and output that you kind of take to write your own. Um, the buff folks have done great work in kind of making this well, more well known and building out an ecosystem and packaging for this stuff. Um, I predict in the future that the open source ecosystem for uh, custom plugins will grow massively. Um, uh, I know that a bunch of companies actually have pretty healthy internal um, plugins that they, they share among themselves for some of the largest gRPC shops. But really what we want is to build this ecosystem and have, um, have everyone feel empowered when they, they have an itch, they can scratch it. So with that, my final, my final feature is the mystery box, which is actually more of a warning that I'm going to leave you off with. Um, this is that uh, while I did mention a lot of the stuff, super cool things all done in the community, it's actually still really hard uh, when you're in the gRPC ecosystem to figure out what is the best practice. Um, you can look at some really popular projects or really useful projects where they describe uh, kind of like the value they're going to give you. And you can tell yourself, hey, that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. But it's really hard for you to know how they're doing it or if they're still maintained um, or if they're using all the best practices. Um, so for example, if you're in the Go ecosystem, there's an amazing library called GoGo Protobuf. It was incredibly useful for many years. Um, unfortunately, it's end of life, it's unmaintained. It's using an old version of Protobuf. You shouldn't use it for new projects. But the functionality provided for many years was second to none. It was an incredibly useful library for squeezing out more performance in protobuf um, and making different various trade-offs actually depending on what domain uh, you're interested in using. Um, but uh, there's also kind of, uh, nowadays at least they have a warning on it, they fully admit that the project is unmaintained and you should look elsewhere, um, but that may not be obvious if you're not reading kind of the readme but you're just looking at documentation or looking at someone else's code. For example, uh, etcd, which is a super well-known, um, very mature product. It's critical to all kinds of cloud-native systems, including Kubernetes itself. Um, it uses GoGo Protobuf. Um, what's, what's a shame is that uh, there are very mature, critical projects out there, but they're not necessarily modern. Um, so when etcd adopted gRPC um, for, I think, I think it was API v2, either API v2 or API v3, um, they adopted all the cutting edge stuff. They, it looked right, it was modern, it was great then, but then they never touched it, um, which is a shame because it means that if you are using modern protobuf tooling um, and you go take the etcd service definition and then generate them, you actually probably can't talk to etcd with that because they haven't kept up and updated the server side. Um, so there's gonna be incompatibilities there. Um, which means that now they're losing a lot of the benefit of the, the gRPC ecosystem. They're not able to um, actually leverage all these tools and modern new things, have folks take their definitions, generate and run. Um, and actually what you actually end up doing in practice is you kind of have a etcd specific client now. Like it's no longer a gRPC client, it's an etcd client because etcd speaks a particular flavor of gRPC that's old and bespoke. Um, it's really unfortunate and if you kind of go out there naively thinking, oh this is a critical project, they must be doing it right, I'm gonna learn from them, copy what they're doing, it, you might end up uh, adopting the wrong things unless you do diligence to make sure that what you're copying is, is right. Um, so that's my word of warning. Um, if you have any other questions, um, you can find me on the social medias, uh, Twitter, Mastodon, GitHub. Um, my company, PopZ, actually has a Discord where we discuss lots of open source technology, considering SpiceDB itself is open source. So if you have questions about necessarily how we're using gRPC or you're interested 
in kind of like tricks that we have or find anything on the issue tracker related to that, feel free to join that and ask questions there. I'm also on the Kubernetes Slack um, if you want to ask me questions directly there or in the gRPC uh, channel itself there. So thank you for your time.